On Wednesday, January 6, 2021, insurrectionists attacked the U.S. Capitol in an effort to prevent the U.S. Congress from certifying the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will become president and vice president, respectively, of the United States on Wednesday, January 20. ASN and the rest of the kidney community look forward to working with the Biden-Harris administration to do everything possible to improve care for millions of people with kidney diseases, kidney failure, and kidney transplants. Every member of the kidney community, including ASN, focuses on policies, not politics. In the 1970s, my mother worked for a member of the House of Representatives in the Cannon House office building. Cannon was one of the buildings that was evacuated on Wednesday, January 6th due to a suspicious package. In the 1980s, I worked for a member of the House of Representatives in the Longworth House office building, which is next to Cannon. My friend and colleague, David White, worked for members of both the House and the Senate. For 40 years, David and I have existed in, on, and around Capitol Hill. In June 1962, former U.S. President John F. Kennedy said, For the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. David, I'm glad you're healthy and safe, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you, Todd, and, and thank you for those words. Um, it is it has been truly something to watch. Um, the good thing is is that we do have a government that is standing and is still in, in, intact, and it has a great deal to do on behalf of the American people, particularly in healthcare and particularly in, in relationship to people who have kidney disease. And I look forward to all of us at ASN being able to engage the new administration and the existing members of the government who do not change in political years uh, to affect really positive things for our members as nephrologists and their patients. That was really well said, David. I Maybe as a sort of first issue to discuss as we think about sort of moving from the executive branch to the legislative branch, one of the things that was lost a little bit in um you know, the activities of January 6th was the fact that um, both of the seats in the uh, Georgia senatorial races um, went to Democrats. And so now it's a 50-50 split, um, which means that the vice president, um, Kamala Harris, would preside over, um, you know, any sort of Senate discussions, but also be de- deciding vote. Um, what's your take on what happened in Georgia? Well, what happened in Georgia... Um, was certainly quite a development um, and something not uh, to be counted on at all. Uh, it had been 1992 since a Democrat had won statewide office um, in Georgia. And so uh, both of those candidates, both of those Democratic candidates winning, um, I think, elated the Democratic Party uh, within Washington and those on Capitol Hill. Um, and it, it just decisively changed, even with a razor thin majority. Uh, kind of what could happen and what's going to happen uh, in the next couple months and throughout the next four years. As you kind of start to to advocate for ASN's priorities in 2021, what's the starting point? Well, the starting point is to make sure that all of the allies that ASN has that really are dedicated to kidney issues are, are still really aware that kidney issues are truly, truly um, still in, in a process of evolving and need their support. And we have to do that within relationship to trying to get a hold over COVID-19 and the pandemic and the legislative things that they're going to want to do to address that. Uh, and so ASN has to be both the supporter and a facilitator who's willing to work across the lines on all kinds of things that are really important. Um, we, we got, you know, we got the immunosuppressant bill into law at the end of, of December, which was fantastic. And now there's other things and there's a lot coming. Uh, and some of it's going to be kidney specific. Some of it's not, but it's also going to be important to our, our members and their patients because it's important in healthcare. So what are some of the kidney specific um, legislation that you're focused on? Well, in terms of kidney, you're going to, you're definitely going to see, uh, you know, a return to the interest in, in, in lobbying for the Living Donor Protection Act. Uh, that is going to be an important one. That's been an important one for a long time. You're also going to want to see, uh, more funding for NIH and, and, and guaranteed funding for NIDDK 
to make sure that the research uh, and the really long needed innovation uh, is really in sight and in grasp for kidney patients, which is another issue. Um, I think probably uh, there will be some amount of work on Capitol Hill to kind of monitor and look at the way Medicare Advantage is working um, in terms of, and that's not to say that it's not working, but just to say it's the first year that that kidney failure patients are going in at the beginning. Um, and it's also going to be, I, the committees are also going to look at what is going to happen with telehealth. Um, they're definitely going to let uh, CMS make certain regula regulations and recommendations, but they're not going to stay out of it. They're definitely going to look at it. Um, and we're going to be looking at ways to kind of work with them and, and work on possible ideas that really help in transplant and and also, is there a possibility of creating some type of benefit for home dialysis assistance, not for the life of dialysis for a person, but for times when it is needed? That's also a very, uh, a very important goal that is worth talking about on Capitol Hill, and we'll see how it kind of works out. And then simultaneously, in addition to, to everything you just described, um, there's the current administration's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And then the transition into the new um, administration and, and sort of their focus on the pandemic, particularly around the distribution of vaccines. Um, how does, I, I guess, in that when you mentioned telehealth, I started thinking about sort of, you know, the fact that the current HHS secretary had extended, um, you know, a lot of the, the, the telehealth roles and things. How do you see that transition going and, and what potential role would ASN and other members of the community play sort of in those issues? Well, I, I think they are going to be very focused on COVID-19 without a doubt. And I think they're probably going to try to use a couple of different ways to go back and increase the direct support payments to American citizens and businesses as well for support. That's going to be really important. And that probably will, will happen in the reconciliation package. Telehealth is going to be a very interesting example. Of it. They did extend the public health emergency, but before they even did that last year, uh, CMS did make it clear that regardless of what year, at what point in the year that the public health emergency is lifted, that the telehealth waivers will continue on through December 31st of that year. So let's say it's not suspended until January of 2022. That would mean they would all continue until uh, December 31st, 2022. I think that part of what the thinking is there is that gives us more time to collect data and look at how telehealth has been used and look at the ways in which it really should be more permanent um, and have some basis to go on. So we, we've seen the, the really large increases of, of usage, um, but we also want to just kind of make sure that it, it's not being overused in any particular way or done in such a way that you kind of lose the, the guardrails for safety for patients. So you, you'd mentioned dates, so you sort of anticipated the sort of next direction I wanted to go. So um at the end of 2020, Congress passed and the president signed the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. And it really is, as we joked about, it was sort of a throwback to the 80s in terms of this omnibus or consolidated omnibus legislation, which included um, funding both changes in entitlement programs, as well as appropriations funding, as well as um, relief related to the pandemic. As you mentioned, the Immunosuppressive Drug Coverage Act was part was included in there. Um, the thing I lost track of, and I, I'm honestly a little embarrassed that I don't know the answer to this, is did that legislation fund the federal government through the end of the fiscal year, which of course is September 30th of 2021, or do they, does Congress need to come back um, and provide funding to get us through the end of the fiscal year? No, I think we're pretty much taken care of to the end of the fiscal year. I, I think they would say that perhaps, I think some some of the Democratic leadership would say that that extra uh, COVID money and extra COVID steps need to be taken um, in order to really kind of keep the economy going. That's not the same thing as keeping the government open, but I think we'll probably hear them married very closely together. Get very closely together, but um, I, I, we should be okay as a as a country until uh, end of September. But then again, after 2020, I hate to make any predictions. 
Yeah, and I know you're saying specifically about government funding. And so so just so I'm clear, I guess there's there's two pieces here. I mean, one is um, you know, the national discussion about providing individuals and businesses additional funding um, um, to help with the recovery. Um, and so it's possible if, if the Congress and the president, the new administration agree to do that, they may include some additional funding, say, for the National Institutes of Health or CDC or FDA related or COVID-19 sort of vaccine rollout. That's on one track. And then simultaneously, they have to start the budget process for um, 2022, which for the federal government starts on um, October 1st of this year. Well, they are going to be very, very focused on the budget process because they've got a couple bites at the apple of what we call reconciliation, and they can do those through budgets. So there is no budget for 2021 at the moment. So the first thing I think they're going to want to do is create a budget for 2021. Um, and the reason why they would do that, of course, even though we already we already have money there, is because by creating a budget for 2021, they then have the ability to, to do reconciliation instructions, which will allow them to go after different things. So you possibly could go after the COVID-19 funding. Uh, you could go after some ACA steps for the uh, Americans um, for the Affordable Care Act. Um, so, you know, I think that there's going to be a budget that's first going to be 2021. And then I think you've got to look at 2022, of course, coming right after that. Um, and there, there you have a lot. With such a razor thin majority in the Senate, they have a lot riding on creating budgets because by creating budgets, they get to go into the reconciliation process, which allows them to bring up certain things. They are limited in scope, but to bring up certain things which are not, um, that you can't filibuster in the Senate and get to be passed by a simple majority, which is going to be critical for them. I'm just thinking about how unusual this year is. Um you have the pandemic, you have all these different sort of budget-related activities and, and funding-related activities. Um, you've just listed out a number of, of goals or objectives or priorities for the, the kidney community. Um, what you haven't really mentioned as much is what's happening in the regulatory environment. So what's likely to happen there over the next couple of months? Well, that is that one is the red hot one. Uh, actually, there's where a great deal is happening. Um, I'll try not to get into the weeds too fast. We've got, as as our listeners know, we've got two nephrology payment models, one which is mandatory and one which is voluntary. Mandatory began on January 1. Um, we still, ASN still believes that uh, as, a, uh, as a matter of policy that there are certain changes that need to be made to adjust that. There is no reason to think that the government is going to do that until leadership, the new leadership, is firmly in place, um, and they take their cues from them. Um, and then there is the voluntary model. Um, there have been some developments in the last two months about certain finances and and various requirements that the government is placing on participation uh, within the voluntary model that I think is going to negatively impact the numbers who end up choosing to participate in the end. That one is scheduled to begin April 1, 2021, um, and I know that we are going to be advocating for some of these changes to be realigned or reconsidered, um, and so there's going to be a lot happening there. Um, we're definitely going to continue to work on the COVID-19 related issues, including telehealth, as I've said, uh, but we're also right now working very hard. We have gotten uh, vaccination prioritization for uh, people working in dialysis facilities, but that did not occur for the dialysis patients in those facilities, although there is some real movement that, and, and we are working very hard on that. And I think that's going to be changing. I think the whole COVID-19 vaccination prioritization is, is changing across the country. We've got a lot of things in uh, transplant that we're working on, and that includes the, the OPO metrics that were put into effect last year that really are designed to help collect more deceased organs. Um, but there's also got to be some real changes about the way the transplant centers are evaluated and how things work in that regard. Um, so that's going to continue to be a big deal. Um, we are going to continue to work on looking for new, better metrics for nephrology. Nephrology is just really using a lot of other specialty metrics. It's very frustrating. A lot of them are not high value. Um, and, it, and then there's some stuff I expect that that they're going to come in and do, they're going to really be designed to bolster 
the Affordable Care Act. It, it, I don't know if you want me to mention any of those or not. Yeah, I, I think it's worth, I mean, maybe that's as good a place to, to close, you know, as any, which is, you know, we had talked previously about the fact that the nominee, the administration's nominee to be the next HHS secretary is, is Javier Becerra, um, who's currently was the attorney general in California, was really a leader among the nation's attorneys general related to, if you will, protecting or, or supporting the Affordable Care Act. So there's a thought that that he was selected because of that expertise. That was one of the reasons why he was um, the candidate put forward. Um, so it sounds like, you know, this this issue of, of shoring up or protecting the Affordable Care Act is going to be a real priority um, for the administration moving forward. Yeah, I think that, that you can really truly say that in the last four years, would, whenever the Affordable Care Act has somewhat been eroded or, or kind of undermined in any way, it was real, it was really on the regulatory front. They never were able to do that in Congress. So there is a whole lot there that is going to need to be done. And, and they have already made it clear they're going to go to work on it right away, which has to do things with such as they may sound small, but if you remember the Trump administration basically cut off all of the navigators and the funding for marketing and outreach. To, to the American public about, you know, going into the exchange to be able to get something, uh, through the Affordable Care Act exchanges. Um, they're going to want to go back and, and they're also going to refinance and resupport the overall exchange system for, in the marketplace. Those subsidies were really important. Most of them have been, uh, or, or they've been hampered in some ways. Uh, they're going to, you're going to see a lot more open and special enrollments. Uh, as opposed to what we've had where the government's been trying to limit those enrollment periods as much as they can. Um, they're going to reverse that expansion of short-term um, health insurance and association health insurance plans that really allowed um, what we would consider to be insufficient amount of essential health benefits to be included. Um, and these are things that are going to really be important. They're going to definitely go out to redo and reverse the guidance for the Section 1332 waivers in Medicaid, where they went and restricted Medicaid to certain levels and they restricted and required work requirements in order to receive Medicaid. You're going to see all of that on the table and you're going to see a real change, I think, very quickly in how that system is working. And it will give Congress the ability to figure out what else it needs to shore up the Affordable Care Act, seeing it back kind of more, in more full implementation. A more robust implementation. So it's going to be, it's it's going to be very interesting to watch. So why don't we close there? Thank you. Thank you.